Good day, everyone. I'm Zane Davis, and we're here to discuss indoor air quality in senior living facilities. We're going to discuss what good indoor air quality looks like, how to monitor uh, for that, and how to maintain your systems to maintain good indoor air quality. With me today, I've got Todd DeMont, who's the Chief Innovation Officer at Madison Indoor Air Quality, and Jeff Beiersdorf, who's one of our Senior Building Services Consultants here at Direct Supply. First, let's just start with the absolute basics. How do you guys even define indoor air quality? Well, indoor air quality is a, it's a measurement of the comfort level and healthiness of the air inside. It's measured using um, some variables, temperature, relative humidity, CO2 levels, particle count, and VOC levels. And then what would you consider to be good or bad indoor air quality? Sure, so ideally you want um, indoor air quality that supports uh, comfort, you know, um, the people inside want to be comfortable and support their long-term and short-term health and their productivity. So there's ranges for all of these variables. The temperature is really, uh, you know, this is probably the variable we're most used to. Um, in the winter, it's probably around 68 degrees, plus or minus five degrees. And in the summer, it's probably around 72 degrees, plus or minus five degrees, based off personal uh, preferences. And then on the relative humidity side, that's another uh, metric that we're kind of used to. You know, the, the, the goal is, you know, not too dry and not too wet. So the range is usually 40% in the winter up to 50, 55% in the summer. Um, then we go over to CO2 and CO2 is a little bit more subtle. You can kind of sense high CO2 levels uh, because it makes you feel drowsy or sluggish. Um, outside CO2 levels are about 400 or 420 parts per million. And indoors, you should try and keep it under 1200 and ideally under 800 parts per million we can start sensing it at about 3,000 parts per million. And when you're on an airplane and you're getting drowsy, uh, that's the feeling of high CO2 levels. Or when you're in a, a meeting in the afternoon and there's a lot of people in a small room and it's, it's feeling, <laughs> so you're having a hard time staying awake, that's high CO2 levels also. Um, then we go over to PM count or particle count. The measurement we use is PM 2.5, um, which is a measurement of ultrafine particles and the 2.5 stands for 2.5 microns or smaller in diameter. Uh, these are the, the particle size we really care about because our body's uh, normal systems can't handle these types of small particles. Um, we can handle PM10 and larger, 10 microns, which is kind of like pollen and uh, dust and dander. But when you get down to PM2.5 and smaller, uh, these particles get into our bloodstream through our lungs, directly into the blood and end up uh, giving lung, heart, and uh, brain issues over time. So PM is definitely the particulate matter um, count in the air and higher is worse. Ideally we want as low as possible. And then about the, uh, the PM particulate matter, is there, um, are you trying to measure specific kinds of particles or is it just measuring all the particles of a certain size? So we're measuring all particles um, of a certain size, 2.5 microns or smaller, and the measurement is micrograms per meter cube. So you're measuring the amount of weight there is in a, in a cubic meter of air. Which is, I would imagine, a measure of density, essentially? Uh, yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. So um, what kind of, uh, and, and this might be disgusting, but that's okay, what kind of particulate matter you know, could we be breathing in right now? Oh, sure. Well, you're breathing in a lot of disgusting stuff right now. Great. Um, your body's used to it, and your body's made to handle up down to PM10 about. Uh, PM2.5 is really coming from combustion byproducts and um, soot and um, some chemical, uh, chemical mechanical processes like brake dust and uh, metal shavings. Uh, these ultra fines your body can't process, really, and they end up in your body and you can't get rid of them. Sounds exciting. I might add also to Todd's comment, the, the, as we define indoor quality, we describe it as maybe, you know, environmental air quality because it's everything, right? It's inside, it's outside. And it really relates to the buildings, the structures, and the people and their health and safety within those buildings. Yep. So, you know, if, you, if you're running a facility, maintaining a facility, say the building's 15 years old, what, what should you really be thinking about between how do I, you know, improve my indoor air quality? Like what could I do to change the status quo into something better versus what kind of maintenance do I need to be doing just to even maintain the status quo? Yeah. Each building has its own design, right? Each building has its own systems. Each building has its own maintenance. 
the, the maintenance portion of the whole thing and into our quality are tied together. One doesn't go without the other, right? So let's take a rooftop unit, for instance, on a facility. Let's make sure your mist screens are clean, your dampers are clean, your actuators, controls all operate. Let's make sure then the next step in is that your filters are up to date and they're changed regularly and they're clean. Your coils have been cleaned and maintained, uh, particularly when there's mold, mildew, and algae that grows within those coil fins and spacing uh, because that gets broadcast into the building as well. And then also consider cleaning ductwork and those kind of things. So that's your normal maintenance. Uh, and then that's equipment maintenance, not addressing what's going on within the building that may be pulled back into the equipment. And then, of course, there's the upgrades, grades you can do as well. Um, so how should I think of a building in terms of the, the indoor air relative to outdoor air? Like how, how do buildings maintain that separation between what might be going on outside and what's going on inside? So depending on the building and the system design, uh, some buildings are uh, monitored with pressure sensors, fresh air sensors, CO2 sensors, as Todd's referenced earlier, talking about CO2. Uh, and then really, it again depends on the building system. Some systems and some buildings were old enough that they were designed with what we call a 3% openable. That means if a building has windows, doors, etc., that if you open them, equated to 3% of the building's fresh air intake, they didn't need anything mechanical to bring in fresh air. And this is where we start to run in all the issues, right? Some buildings are newer, designed differently, so then they are bringing in fresh air. Uh, so at that point, you're mixing the two together and you're not really separating them per se. Interesting, okay. So you, you spoke a little bit about some of the um, maintenance practices. What are some of the improvements that a long-term care facility could be looking into or considering? Yeah, so long-term care facilities, hospitals, everybody has improvements they can make. Let's start with something simple, filters, right? Let's bump your filtration, your MERV level, up to a level that your system can handle. So incrementally, bump up a level, check your system. Do your motors overheat? Do your air flows change? And if not, then bump up to the next level. And let's see if we can get as high as you can. There are some forthcoming mandates that could say everybody needs MERV 13. And if your system can't handle it, then that turns into possibly system replacements. It all depends. Uh, UV, another good example to add to the uh, interior of a system. Needlepoint bipolar ionization, another good product to add to the system, which will help. Uh, that would basically be if you use both a pants and suspender approach and help the indoor air quality overall. Uh, for people that may not know the phrase, what is the pants and suspenders approach? Well, really meaning you're, you're trying to cover your bases and if one fails, you've got a backup. But each device is doing something slightly different as well. Okay. So, Todd, you're in charge of innovation. What uh, changes have you been seeing lately that you think are going to start showing up in facilities? Well, definitely the, um, the building techniques that have changed over the past 30 years have driven a lot of these changes. So as the buildings become tighter and more and better insulated, um, the need for mechanical ventilation and bringing in outside air mechanically is necessary. And as buildings become more insulated, um, the heat load inside the building is reduced and therefore um, the air conditioning has to run less. But the air conditioning historically has been the primary way to control humidity. So with a lower heat load, um, but same, same level of humidity, um, dealing with humidity specifically uh, decoupled from the temperature load has become more and more, uh, more and more important. Interesting. So if I'm understanding correctly, the, the buildings have gotten better at both maintaining a temperature, which means the air conditioning is running less frequently. Correct. Which means some of what we're used to, which is our air conditioning is going to automatically be dehumidifying while controlling the temperature is going to be, is going to happen less. Correct. Is that the way to think of it? Exactly. And same thing with fresh air. So the tighter the buildings, you know, as building construction becomes better and the code becomes better, there's less natural leakage in the building. Uh, and so you, you know, code is requiring at a certain level of construction, uh, mechanical ventilation. So when you mechanically ventilate, you have to maintain your equipment and make sure your actuators or your fresh air actuators are working and the filters have been replaced uh, and are up to date because you're bringing in outside air and you want to make sure you're filtering that air. Um, and you want to make sure you bring in the right volume of that air. So just by way of an example, if a building were not to bring in any fresh air and it was fairly tightly sealed, what would that turn, like what would accumulate? What would be the, the downside? Well, that essentially is what sick building syndrome is. Okay. So what happens is um, 
you get high levels of VOC and off-gassing uh, from internal uh, furniture and cleaning agents. Um, you don't have enough, uh, you get high levels of CO2, um, and really th the building is not purging the air enough, right? And you're not getting enough turnover of the air, and uh, you get short-term issues of uh, dizziness, scratchy throat, nausea, nausea uh, all the way to uh, long-term health issues. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you're really describing sick building syndrome there. Let's take it even a little further and look at it the opposite way. Let's take the older buildings. The older buildings have tons of infiltration, and I think people forget that maintaining that building envelope, your attic, your attic insulation, your siding, your insulation, any of the ceiling and caulking to prevent that infiltration um, uh, is detrimental. Poor infiltration can take an HVAC system that's been good as your building's degraded and turn it into something that can't keep up you know, with what's going on and then add to that over the last 15 years, the design degree temperature and humidity days have climbed in numbers and climbed in quantity of degrees. Can, can I interrupt you real quick? Can you mm -hmm. define that? The, the temperature, something degree days is what yeah, you said. Yeah, so when we design buildings and we look at buildings, the engineer looks at the local code, the most recent code as the time the building was designed, and we have a parameter, a setting based on the area of the country, based on so like the temperature fluctuations in the, in the area. area. Yep. That's correct. Yep. Okay. That adapts to the climate. Those have changed over the last 15 years. Yep. And now when a building had a system that could keep up, it no longer can keep up. Interesting. Yeah, so a great example of that is as your building envelope deteriorates and you get more infiltration, it shows up in the winter time uh, in excessively uh, dry conditions because you, your heating system can make up the, the temperature loss, right? So as we're leaking out our warm air and bringing in cold outside air, the, the heating system can make up for that, but you're losing the humidity. And so you end up getting really dry interior conditions and people complain about that, right? There's, there's nose and throat issues with excessively low humidity. Are there other uh, issues in terms of what's in the air when humidity gets really low? So that, that's a good point. So extremely low relative humidity, um, that can drive um, bad outcomes uh, with pathogens, right, and sicknesses. Um, it definitely can drive issues with your sinus systems and your skin too, right? So it makes you more susceptible to uh, sickness. Even levels of PM 2.5 and lower, uh, you know, as an example, when it's really dry, if you watch the sun coming through a window and look at all that dust that's dancing in the sunbeam, and you try to reach up and grab it, what happens? Your hand goes through it, it whirls around, it comes back behind your hands, right? Um, and the more, the drier it is, the more it floats around, the harder it is to capture. That stuff's hard to capture, period, anyway, you know. Interesting. So getting back to, to some of the maintenance practices you can do, what are the benefits for the system itself when it's properly maintained? Yeah, so maintaining the system properly just says, listen, my equipment's gonna stay healthier. My coils, for instance, um, to reference maybe something Todd mentioned earlier about dehumidification, a lot of the more modern equipment now, we're turning down our CFM. Rule of thumb used to be 400 CFM a ton. We're turning that down slightly to spend more time with that air across the coil, more time dehumidifying, right? And you want that coil to function properly. So if you don't clean your coil, as an example, I've seen RTUs taken off the top of buildings, 10 tons, 15 tons, cut the coils in half, and what people thought they were doing for maintenance and keeping things clean, when you looked in the middle of the coil, had algae, mold, and mildew stationed in the center of the coil, lodged in the coil bank and between uh, the fins, and then you add to that the moisture from the coil, and it's just a growth petri dish, right? So maintaining not only how the air comes in, keeping cotton woods off screens, keeping mist eliminator screens clean, keeping your dampers and actuators operating, keeping your filters clean, uh, your coils clean, your duct clean, all just says now I'm not, at least I'm not broadcasting that into the building. And then going further into the building, what are the benefits to the building itself? Like are we preventing things like mold mildew from growing in the building? You, well, you're preventing from carrying any mold mildew spores into the building itself. They won't act as a seed, but yep. again, if you're keeping your coils clean and they're dehumidifying them like they will, they'll prevent mold from growing within the building as long as they're sized properly and everything else. And, and the filtration system's cleaning the, the air inside the building also, right? right? So okay. as you're recirculating the air through the building, through your system, the filtration system is picking up the particle count. Now, 
we all want the building to be well maintained. We all want the, the system to be well maintained. But what are the benefits to the individuals in the building, both the staff and the, the residents of properly maintaining the system? Well, we're trying to maintain a good work environment, a good indoor quality, human safety, human comfort, all of those things together. As Todd mentioned, maintaining the humidity between 40 and 60 percent. There's pluses and minuses to both if you're above and, be, and below. Uh, and then maintaining the system itself just prevents anything more from being generated and pushed into the building above and beyond what's already created in the building itself. Todd mentioned already uh, the things that can happen with glues, cleaners, new furnishings, drywall work, formaldehydes, aldehydes, all the things that can be within the building itself, right? And you're trying to, uh, particularly if you've got fresh air coming into the building, ventilate, dilute, and flush that building as much as you can. Yeah, yeah you're essentially focusing on comfort and then health, short-term and long-term, and productivity. Right and uh, optimizing your IAQ, it, you know, it maximizes all those things for you. Yeah, the, just think about, as Todd mentioned, productivity, the improvements you make to the system above and beyond the normal indoor air quality, the things you can add to make it even better. Uh, in a day when we're struggling with work staff and a day we're struggling with finding people to do what we need to do, Princeton, Harvard University have done studies and said, listen, if I improve the indoor air quality in my building, I can improve my workers' quality of life and their productivity, reduce their sick times, and the productivity increase could be eight to 10%. How beneficial was that yeah. be to a facility? Yeah, you know? for sure. Beyond the, the productivity, are there any surprising either benefits or harms that you guys have found with indoor air quality? Todd, you want to take Well, that? to me, what was eye-opening is the long-term effect of high CO2 levels and high PM 2.5 levels. The long-term effects are uh, are severe. Um, you know, uh, there's uh, cardiac issues and there's dementia issues and brain issues related to both of those. Uh, also, uh, for pregnant women, and so if you actually Google that, look into long-term health effects of high PM levels or even high CO2 levels, um, it, it will convert you quickly into uh, you know an acolyte for a high you know for great IAQ. I mean, it's. It's eye-opening. The, the World Health Organization uh, blames PM 2.5 for being the fourth leading cause in the world for uh, early disability and life years, which is um, a, a way to reduce your quality of life. So it's the number four reason PM 2.5. That's crazy. I think additionally for me, the surprises are the impact that people realize or don't realize the indoor quality and the maintenance can have on their facility. You know, a lot of people come to work, they're there eight to 10 hours a day. Yeah, they might get a little funky, but they're gone then. Then they're in fresh air or they're home and they're indifferent. They're not locked into that building yep. under that poor indoor air quality environment for the duration that our seniors might be. And now that sick building system really starts to take effect. And takes effect to the point where, as an example, a mom may want to come pick up grandma because grandma's having some issues and take her to the doctor. And they stop for lunch. And grandma says, you know, I feel pretty good today. Things are okay. I'm breathing well. They go to the doctor. Grandma complains about what her symptoms have been. Doctor prescribes something. They go back to the building. Now she's back in that sick building syndrome. Yep. She's got medication for something that she doesn't really have. And, and then this is this vicious circle, yep. Yep. you know. Yep. Yeah, it's the environment itself that's the issue. Yeah, exactly. So uh, another eye-opening angle I, I've uncovered is the, the huge impact of our behavior inside these buildings, how it can affect IEQ. And so when you're cooking or when you're showering or you're in the bathroom, really using the exhaust fans is key, right? So if we could have source control, which is essentially where you're creating the pollution, you're evacuating the pollution from your indoor air and putting it outside. So I, I can't recommend highly enough, and I try and convince my kids of this how important it is, to turn on the range hood uh, and to turn on the exhaust fans when you're in the bathroom because the humidity level, humidity, uh, and then the VOCs and the, the PM that's created by cooking, uh, it's amazing, it's eye-opening. And when you, when you or if you start monitoring this, you won't believe the impact of the exhaust fan and what you're doing in your room just by burning candles or by cooking, it's astounding. If you take, to add on to that, the, the kitchen, let's do this kitchen as an example. <coughs> I've been in environments where we had large commercial kitchens and small kitchens and even plants where we were processing uh, cheese and waxing cheese. People are working in this environment 
in the assembly lines. People are working in the kitchen next to the stoves and without the proper ventilation and makeup air to help that ventilation function properly, you'd be amazed of what's really in the air if you follow the ductwork up from, say, a kitchen hood or an exhaust fan over a process line in a plant that's waxing cheese and go up on the roof, might be 20, 30 feet away, and look inside the ductwork in the fan itself, it's caked with wax and caked with grease. And you're breathing that all the while you're doing this work because it's atomized, aerosolized in the air and you don't really realize it. Interesting. So switching back to the um, maintenance and maintenance strategy, um, how should a uh, maintenance director or whoever's in charge of maintaining the building put together a plan for maintaining their indoor air quality? First and foremost, let's make sure they've got a good maintenance program in place, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people do not. In the last two years, while we've been installing, say, Needlepoint, we've realized that as we were doing these installations, maintenance and corporate leads have showed up at the facilities to help and watch these installations and monitor what's happening, and they've realized maintenance staffs are lacking as well. So a good maintenance program, right? Mm -hmm. Filter change, and filter change isn't based on what the manufacturer's recommendation is, that's a start. It's what's in the air at the time, right? What are your seasonal changes? Mold, like my, for instance, right now, this time of year in my house, everything's coated yellow. Everything's just yellow with pollen. And then there's the next thing, there's cottonwoods and so on and so forth. So filters need to be changed accordingly, right? So again, maintaining it from the outside to the inside, to the coil, the filter, the ductwork, and just continuing that maintenance, even as to the degree as if you've let your blowers get so full of debris because you haven't maintained your filters or your coils yeah. that you're cleaning your blower wheels and you're monitoring amp draws on motors and making sure your motor cooling holes are clean so they can cool and do their job the way they should. So if you were to walk into a facility, where would you even get started if you're trying to figure out where there might be issues? Well, first of all, you got to know your building. Do you have a set of plans for your building that shows all the systems? If you don't, let's do an audit. Let's audit the building. Let's figure out where these systems are, what types of systems they are. Do we have a maintenance program or not? If we do, when's the last time we did our maintenance? What is that maintenance that we have completed? Do we have to improve that maintenance as we move forward? Uh, Todd, you've mentioned monitoring. Beyond what you can see by walking through a facility, what, what would you use monitoring for? And what kind of decisions would it help you make? So there's two types of monitoring. Um, I prefer uh, monitoring over time so we can see trends. So we can walk in with meters, handheld meters, and get spot readings. And that can point you directionally if there might be an issue. Uh, but I prefer and recommend that we monitor over time and pick up uh, system, systemic issues uh, that are occurring, right, that we may not see with a handheld meter. Um, so really, we'd be measuring temperature, relative humidity, PM 2.5 count, uh, VOCs and CO2 and really with those five variables we feel we can get a, a great feel for what's going on in the building and how the IAQ is doing. And then what, uh, what sort of um, decisions or changes would you end up recommending based on what you learned? So if there's localized areas of high PM or, or VOCs or even humidity, you know, the, the easiest way to address that um, is control the pollution source, right? So if we can, if we can have spot uh, exhaust ventilation where that pollution source is, that's probably the ideal way. Uh, if you just have open or not tight uh, cleaners <laughs> or disinfectants, I mean, you definitely want to address that, right? So that might just be um, a procedural change on how you're maintaining your cleaning closets. Um, you know, humidity sensing exhaust fans in bathrooms might be a good upgrade, right? So uh, I know um, coming from a dehumidifier company, I would always have these discussions with my mom who said she loved high humidity. Um, you know, it's like, you don't understand the secondary issues that high humidity cause, right? So uh, exhaust fans in bathrooms that turn on when they sense high humidity, right? Do, they do it automatically. I, I think that's probably a great improvement. Um, and really, a lot of times what I've seen are the, the buildings are set up properly for ventilation originally, so the CO2 levels should be under control and in the optimum ranges. And when they get out of control, it's usually, believe it or not, it's either a setting that's been changed or something's mechanically broken. And it's not much to change it or improve it because largely the buildings are set up, uh, you know, what retrofits or remodelings may change things, but largely they're set up properly. It's just they're not maintained and kept up. Um, Jeff, in your experience, you know, you've gone into, I'm sure, hundreds of facilities at this point. What are some of the um, 
issues you've seen and how have those issues been resolved? I think the biggest issue we've seen, again, is poor maintenance, yep. right? And a lot of the maintenance folks think that when they open their unit and they pull the filter, if they've changed the filter appropriately, there's still maybe dust on the coil, right? Everything that's come through that filter or snuck around it. Uh, but the dust isn't the depth of the coil. They have to remember that the depth of the coil is where a lot of How the deep is it to the coil? Well, it depends on the system. A residential yep. system, you might be four inches, right? Okay. A commercial system, you could be anywhere between six and 10 inches, depending on how big the unit is, how many rolls of coil, how many circuits, that kind of thing. Uh, so, is, so that's a big one. Is that kind of cleaning something that a, a typical maintenance director can do themselves, or would you need a professional to come in for that? Well, we recommend a professional. You know, drug supply can help them with that. Um, because it, there are some foaming agents that are included in that along with pressure washers and other things, but you have to be careful not to flood the system, flood the unit, get water down in the building and, and those kinds of things as well. Um, and I think then additionally, as we're talking about keeping the air diluted within the building, people have to keep in mind that we have to pay attention to what's outside as well, right? So last year when we had the wildfires and wildfire smoke was coming into uh, our areas, on days when it was misty and kind of foggy looking, you knew the smoke was here. But on days when it wasn't, you didn't know the smoke was here. But if you used a website like airnow.gov, you could really see how high the levels of carcinogens were that were in the air. So what you do with your outside airs, particularly whether you've got a COVID outbreak or no COVID outbreak, where you're adjusting, not adjusting, truly has to be monitored from the outside to the inside, right? So you know what you're bringing into the building. What was that website again? It was airnow.gov. Yeah, and Jeff, I, I just want to add to that, that uh, my dad, who's now an advanced IEQ hobbyist, um, he's monitoring his indoor air quality and outdoor air quality also, and he lives in Colorado, and he's picking up the wildfire PM count from, from California, right? Yeah. So in Colorado, states, across, multiple states, and you're picking it up. So it's not just the people in California. Yeah, it's not just that local area. Yep. Yeah, yeah, we, I mean, we saw it come across the U.S. into Wisconsin and kind of ramp down into Georgia. Uh, in different times depending on where the jet stream was traveling. Um, and Colorado also has a good uh, website for monitoring wildfire smoke. Okay, we've got two more questions. One is, uh, are there any common misconceptions that you guys have run into? Around the mechanicals, around indoor air quality around in mechanicals, general? mechanicals, indoor air quality, maintenance, any of it? For me, the misconception is, is that indoor air quality isn't that important. Yeah. And, and it is. Um, Get yourself in a nice, clean, fresh, ventilated, well-maintained building after you've been in a different building and the difference is dramatic. Yeah. yeah, one I run into is historically we've called it fresh air when you bring in outside air. But uh, for better or for worse, outside air is not always fresh air. And Jeff kind of alluded to that with the wildfires. Um, it's definitely an issue over in Asia, right, with China and India. But even here in the United States, Outside air is not always fresh air. This, the CO2 level generally is gonna be good, but we've definitely seen in buildings that we've monitored where fresh air intakes can be where they're idling diesel trucks outside, right? Or when a generator turns on, as a backup generator cycles through on the rooftop, and that's right where the fresh air intake is, right by the exhaust. So fresh air, um, it, it's a good feeling and a good way to think about it, but it's not always fresh. And, and now the, the, the industry has really kind of turned to calling it outside air. Right. Yeah, now that you say that, it's similar to what Todd mentioned. We've seen hospital environments with helicopter pads and helicopter fumes being pulled in through their, their louvers, right? Plant discharge, crop field uh, dust and debris, crop sprays, all these things are just things to consider while you're manipulating your system. So if the outdoor air is currently poor, are there any changes or modifications you should be making to your building? Sure, that's a great question, and I'm gonna answer it two different ways. So in general, uh, if you have challenging outdoor air conditions, um, such as uh, shoulder seasons, where you don't have a big heat load, uh, but you might have a moisture load uh, in the fall or spring, um, in general, your building uh, HVAC system can handle these. You might go a little bit out of range at times, 
Uh, but if the, if the systems maintain well, it'll handle and you'll get back down to normal. And that's why we like to monitor over time, right? So if we went and get, did a spot check and saw that you might have 59% relative humidity, we could get nervous there. But when we're monitoring, we're actually comparing against outside weather also, or conditions, and we can see that actually, you know, a, a, a rainstorm came through, right? And this, this drove that. So I wouldn't, get, I wouldn't get nervous about that, and we're definitely not recommending to have a, a facilities manager watching the dials all the time and turning dials or gauges trying to uh, optimize indoor air quality, right? Once the system's set up and maintained, it should do a pretty good job over time of leveling out. Um, in worst case scenarios, say you're in California when there are wildfires, you might want to make a decision and say it's time to turn off ventilation. We realize there's going to be an impact on higher CO2 levels, but we can't handle an amount of PM that's coming in, right? And you might want to make that decision. But in general, I would say the billing system that's well-maintained can handle it. Okay, last question. Is there anything else you'd like our viewers and the audience to, to know that we haven't touched on yet? Yeah, I think systematically people just need to remember that indoor air quality and environmental air quality is a big thing, right? And just start being proactive, as Todd mentioned. Start making sure you're monitoring your systems. People put uh, things in attics and never see them again, right? Don't touch them. Forget about filters because they're out of sight, out of mind and things just get worse and worse and worse. So it's really paying attention to what's going on within your home, within your environment, and within the world in general so you can monitor what's happening. Yeah, I would add one thing to what Jeff's saying is in the mid-Atlantic region, uh, where there's crawl spaces, that's another place where people want to forget that it's not part of the building. But really, the air does communicate between the crawl space and the, and the living space, as well as the attic, right? So if you're storing paint and chemicals in the crawl space and think it's okay, it's actually going to be communicating with your living space. And I, and I did have one final fact, fun fact I want to share. Um, that, you know, uh, I kind of share this at uh, you know, parties or get-togethers. The worst indoor air quality measured in the United States. Uh, so PM 2.5 is measured on micrograms per meter cubed. Uh, and good is about 12 or below. Probably in this room right now, uh, I would guess we're at six or below. So you want a low <laughs> number, lower is always better. Um, really below 35 or um, you're okay, above 50, you probably wanna start looking into what's going on. If you're cooking a lot, you'll probably see above 50. The worst indoor air quality measured in the United States is actually in the subway system of New York City. So poor ventilation, you've got combustion byproducts, and you also have brake dust from the, the braking of the, the trains, and uh, it, it averages 750 micrograms per meter cubed. Right, so just think if you were a beat cop walking that all day. It's a big number, yeah, for sure. Terrible. So. Jeff, we've discussed a ton here about both improving your system, maintaining it. How can direct supply help with all of this? Well, direct supply can help by a couple different ways. Number one, through a consultative manner. Uh, anybody can reach out to us and have a great conversation with us around their building, their building type, what the challenges are they're seeing. And we serve uh, nationwide, 16 to 17,000 communities. So we have a nationwide pile of contractors per se that we utilize that'll help us get through those scenarios as well if we need eyes on the ground, boots on the ground, and then we can help them through the final resolution and then also come in and double check and do some testing to make sure that that resolution is coming true. Cool, thank you. And we've also got a lot of resources on our website. We have a lot of blog posts about indoor air quality. There's um, been some state funding for improving indoor air quality. We have both uh, blog posts as well as resources around that. So do visit our website and check out the resources there. If you have any questions, you can also email us at indoorairequality at directsupply.com. So just indoorairequality, all one word, at directsupply.com. But we're going to end there. I want to thank you both for your, your time and your expertise, and I want to thank you all for watching. Have a great day.